Welcome to the TAPA webinar. In today's session, Data Intelligence, Preventing Cargo Crime. Let me introduce our speakers we have online today. From PSI, we have Mr. Ramesh. From TAPA, we have our board member, Mrs. Silva Raj, as well as our TAPA IIS Working Committee, Mr. Kevin, Mr. Prashant, and Mr. Malik. Last but not least, from TAPA, Mr. Tony Luck, Chairman of TAPA Asia Pacific who is also our host for today's webinar. Hi, Tony. I shall hand it over to you now. Crystal, uh, thank you very much for that warm introduction and uh, uh, good morning and uh, good evening uh, and good afternoon uh, to our listeners uh, or to our viewers rather. So um, if we can go to, to the next slide, I just want to uh, uh, thank our, uh, our guests for coming on this morning. Uh, and look, before I start, and um, before I hand the um, the session over to the to the team, look, I just want to um, to quickly cover some of the aspects of TAPA uh, for those listeners who have never um, heard about us before. So, look, TAPA is a uh, we're a non-profit organisation. We're actually a supply chain um, trade association, um, for originally focusing on 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 the security aspect. So. 23 years ago when TAPA was first um, formed uh, and then replicated in, in um, TAPA EMEA and TAPA APAC, um, they put together a set of global standards and it was basically for managing um, warehouses. Uh, and look, as time went on, um, those security professionals uh, developed uh, additional uh, standards which you can see on your, on your uh, presentation there. Now look, from that, um, you know, uh, the committees at the time realized that you couldn't just solve things on your own, not just from standards. Okay, so what they realized is that they needed to share crime intelligence, and that's a massive subject uh, about what we're talking about today. And you'll see some of the benefits that have come from that. But I also realized that we needed to have partnerships, and you'll also hear about how we have those partnerships. And um, look, when we start looking at the uh, uh, the, the team on the call today. Uh, you can see where TAPA has been forging those sort of um, partnerships. Now, of course, um, in terms of that partnership comes the exchange of information. And of course, that exchange of information is done in a, a lawful way where we have a, an MOU uh, with the authorities. Uh, we've learned that's the, from best practice um, with um, uh, London Heathrow, where we had a, a memorandum of understanding with the Metropolitan Police at Heathrow there to exchange information. Um, it's always done in a in a lawful and transparent way, uh, and what it does it means that if we have a um, an agreement in place, when the officer moves on to other duties or something of that nature, uh, it means that we still have that established uh, process uh, in place. And of course, look, hopefully um, those of you who are TAPA members and um, those who of you uh, are not, you would have seen some of our news and events. Uh, training organizations. Uh, we have a, a great secretariat team and a great board uh, who are helping uh, to put out these articles together uh, and, um, and make sure that we try to uh, keep you as fully uh, as informed as possible, especially at the moment with the, the COVID-19. Okay, let's go to the next slide and get these some panel here. Look, I have to apologize. I haven't got my camera on today uh, and that's because uh, I'm using my personal Apple laptop and I, I can't, I, I don't know why, but the configuration won't put the camera on. So uh, some of the some of the board said that earlier, that's a good thing. So the the, the viewers don't have to look at your uh, your ugly face. And uh, so thank you for that. So now I'm going to force you to look at theirs. And uh, so if I can just introduce Silver. Uh, so Silver uh, is our IIS lead and also a board member of TAPA. And on this, on this working committee, we also have uh, Kevin. Kevin is working uh, for HP. Uh, he's normally based in Singapore, but uh, he's, uh, he's hanging around in Shanghai uh, with uh, COVID. Uh, Prashant uh, is, a, uh, is, is our TAPA member. Okay? He's not a board member. He's actually an IIS working party member. Uh, and look, don't forget, you know, we encourage uh, the members to get involved in the working parties. And, uh, and look, it's Great for self-learning. That's actually how I started. Uh, I got involved in a working party, started to lead the IIS, and um, and eventually ended up chairing the uh, TAPA Asia um, board. 
Uh, and look, a good friend uh, of mine, Malik, um, I'm not a great lover of his football team, but um, uh, he's, uh, he's a great guy. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's been a good friend of mine and he's, look, he's been actively involved in, in the IIS for, for some years now, right? So look, we have a great team of uh, experts here. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to hand over to, to Silva and then he, Silva's going to run the session with the team. So over to you, Silva. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, and I think like many of us here, you see our background. Most of us are in the comfort of our home uh, due to the current situation that we are in. And um, that's why we also feel that at this current situation, it's important that TAPA which many of you are members or those of you who plan to become members um, wants to bring to you what the benefits are and most importantly what is one of the program that we have in TAPA and as Tony mentioned um, in the early years when TAPA started and all the intention was to actually work with a lot of law enforcement agencies and also to collaborate with companies as well to understand what is significant and important in your supply chain, especially at the last mile of things. And what we have done so far, and I can share with you some good practice that we have seen in other regions of how reporting actually makes a big difference and the statistics and data that comes out of it actually creates a, a very good platform for you in your organization. Here you can see is actually some of those partners that TAPA has been collaborating. Some of it is outside Asia Pacific, of course, in APEC, we are looking at working closely with more agencies. At the moment, we have the Royal Thai Police and Hong Kong Police Force, but upcoming, we want to actually build our partnership and network with many more agencies that's around. So this is one way that I see as an opportunity for me and my team that you see here to actually bring about a good, strong platform for members to actually come in to understand and report incidents that they are seeing. Yeah, um, maybe we go to the next slide, which actually um, will talk to you or you can see through this information here. Today, if you want to find out incidents and events that's happening related to cargo theft, a lot of times these are all segregated in all newspapers, articles and media. And what we see nowadays due to this latest COVID-19 situation, is issues with regards to fake masks and all coming out in the market, counterfeit products. So what TAPA is trying to do is to actually bring all of this under one platform. And that's where our committee, which was developed many years ago, is now coming back again to bring to you a platform of things. And you might ask yourselves this question, how big is cargo crime in Asia Pacific? Of course, we heard a lot about it in the papers, we see sometimes in the news, but what statistics do we have exactly to know what's happening around, around Asia? And here you can see this report from BSI that a lot of these things are actually happening, some in very small scales, but some of them are quite large. A lot of times when all these kind of incidents happens, one thing that goes away sometimes is not knowing about how these events take, took place. And the details, or like what they always say, the devil lies in the details. And these details are actually in the hands of many organizations out there because they are the ones who are put into this spot or this situation where they have to deal with. So that's why we wanted to have a way, a mechanism where we could actually bring all this data together to understand from people what happens and this becomes a case study or a learning opportunity for the rest of the companies to learn from from here. So if we go to the next slide, we can see basically what IIS is, which is what our committee is taking care of. This is the incident information service. The benefit of this or the purpose of this is first of all, is to able to bring across information to all companies in this region and in the other regions as well to know what is happening in Asia. And this also serves as a centralized portal where you can come in as a member to find out information and to know what other companies have done in order for them to come out of this or recover from it. 
So the whole intention of our IIS is to bring across information and valuable data for you. So this is where you will probably ask yourself, how am I or how does this thing going to work? And what happens when I input and data? Before I joined TAPA, when I was as a member who signed up for this organization, it's part of my companies that I worked in, I always had this question in my mind, will my incidents that I'm going to report, will this be flagged out or will this be made public and obvious? Many of us today definitely have an obligation to our organizations where we need to keep data privacy. We do not wish to or nobody wants to speak about that. So that's where the confidentiality part comes in. So if you saw the previous slide, what it does is when you actually go into TAPA, when you go into the IIS website, when you actually input your incidents, your incidents are captured. Basically, only the incidents are captured. We do not need the details of what the company is, the organizations are. And our intention is after capturing all these details, we can actually provide members with at least a quarterly update of what are the kind of incidents that's happening which gives you an opportunity to actually understand what's going to what's what to look out for or what the latest trends are in terms of supply chain crime so if we can move further a bit so we spoke about that and you might ask us what is the success of this because as you know in tapa there's three regions that's operating and i would like to share with you the success story in emia region of them using IIS and you can see that a lot of a lot of those incidents that they have been doing have actually helped the band members and the numbers have actually increased which means to say open reporting becomes a culture people come forward to share what is the issues and these are also helpful for law enforcement authorities as well because as i said in partnership we can also help to inform these authorities who are also supporting us in some manners and some ways to actually come up get this right information so next slide if you don't mind okay yeah so so far what we have seen is actually a few incidents that has been input inside our tapa and i just wanted to share with you two case studies so this was quite a recent one that came in on the 15th of april and if you can as you can see this helps us to segregate what this whole event is and give people an avenue to understand something like this could happen, what was the outcome of it, and how can we prevent this from happening again. So this is one case study that we have. The next case study is also similar, where probably someone who was a bit more thirsty had to go for a drink, and it happened in a manner which actually ended up as a crime. But Nevertheless, it's important and this thing happens on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? And these are things and these are events that we want to see that you will, as members, will eventually benefit from. And as I said, the benefit comes from us as well when we start to have that open reporting culture. So this is so, what so our... Silver, I, yes. in, in this particular case, uh, as I understand, that was whiskey, right? So they were going for the <laughs> top of the range streets, right? <laughs> yes exactly and i think this was on a new year's day for india all right so 14th mm. april is actually the new year in india so as i said it was a joyous occasion which turned out to become a crime that's all mm. <laughs> okay so exactly yeah so moving on right now what we can see is uh, practically the post covid situation time many countries are now coming back to recovery and during that difficult period of COVID situation, uh, we did see a lot of supply chain issues that happened. Many of it reported, many of it yet to be reported. So what you are going to see maybe in the next part of today's webinar is uh, some insights from, from, from Ramesh who will be sharing with us what happened during those times. And this actually can kind of give you an avenue to understand what is really important for us. Uh, being in IIS and as a member, how you can actually contribute to IIS. So I think on behalf of my team, uh, what I would like to ask for the members in this call and those who are not members to understand that IIS is going to be a platform 
that's going to not only be beneficial for just TAPA members, it's also going to be beneficial for a lot of people around. And eventually this would become one data point, one website for you to keep every morning when you get up, when you look at the CNN news, probably the next news that you want to see is what are the TAPA IIS incident reports that has happened today. So to help us to achieve that, I would like to encourage all of you to look at this and start that open reporting culture that I just mentioned. So very nicely with that topic, I think I would like to hand it over back to Tony and who will introduce Ramesh and bring us through the next part of the webinar. Thanks everyone for your support and attention so far. Tony, all yours. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to uh, reiterate the hard work that you and the team are doing. Um, so looking within Tapper, obviously we have the board of management and um, as I explained, Silva runs the IIS team and the, these, these chaps here are, are leading the charge in terms of, uh, of, of that sharing of data. Uh, and look, as I said in the chat, uh, the sharing of information is, is critical, right? And um, uh, as Silva said, in terms of the confidentiality, and uh, we normally get questions on it, so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we get another question today on it. But the, what we have to remember is that, um, you know, Tapper is a organization uh, that has been managing data from Fortune 500 companies uh, since it started uh, over 23 years ago now. So in all of that time, uh, you know, we have not experienced any uh, uh, em embarrassing leaks of the data. And look, if you saw, um, as you saw from the slide, uh, we're not publishing uh, members' names, uh, you know, whether it's Tony Lug or whether it's Silver, whether it's Malik uh, uh, or, or somebody else. Um, th this is not about scoring points in that respect. This is, uh, as we've quite uh, rightly mentioned, this is about the, the, the whole issue impacting the industry, all right? Because the, the, the cost of crime uh, is obviously increasing the cost of the, the eventually the cost of the product uh, inside, the, uh, inside the store or, or wherever the end user is. So and look, in terms of confidentiality, we've not had um, uh, any, any uh, issues on that. Now look, before I go over to, uh, to Ramish, uh, I just want to uh, see if we're ready for our uh, uh, first poll. It's always good to run these polls uh, on these calls and um, look, it helps us with feedback. So um, uh, I'll pass over to uh, Sam. Hi everyone. So we will start our first poll. Um, if you have actually heard about TAPA before this webinar, yeah, just go on and key in your answer. We're just a quick understanding of whether um, are you a member right now or have you heard about TAPA? And if you'd like to know more about TAPA, you can always send us an inquiry email. Sure, great. Just give us a few moments for everyone to key in their response. Oh, thank you. There we go. We have our results. So most of us here um, heard about TAPA. For those of you who have not heard about, our, heard about us, please feel free to give us, uh, drop us an email or give us a call and you will be able to understand more about um, IIS and how this will help you and your organization. So moving on, we will have our next poll to find out more about um, how do you review the risk of your cargo route? That is very crucial. How often do you review the risk? So please also key in your answer there so that uh, our experts, our panelists can understand and share their advice to you during the Q&A session. Okay, there we go. We have our poll results. I'll hand this over to um, Tony, Silva and Ramesh. Okay, thank you. So look, what I'll do, let me, um, let's take the um, poll results in the in the q and a session um, and uh, let everybody um, just have a think about that before we we go into answering it. So what I do, I just um, come back and ask some of the team um, uh, some of those issues. Uh, look the do you remember what I said at the beginning in terms of Tapper, you know one of the things that we do, we have partnerships and uh, building partnerships is key. Uh, and look, I'm pleased to uh, to have uh, Ramish uh, right on our uh, webinar today. Uh, look, Ramesh uh, and I have already done a, um, uh, a podcast 
um, on, on some of the impacts of pharmaceutical, COVID, et cetera. Uh, and look, uh, what we will do, we will make sure that all of you get uh, access to, to that podcast as well. And Sam, Samantha will send out the, uh, the locations where you can get that. Uh, and look, the, you can learn so much from listening to these podcasts. They're highly educational, so please do get involved. But um, so if I can just say good morning to you, Ramesh, how, how are you today? Hey, Tony. Good morning. Good morning. All is good and well. Good, good. So Ramesh represents the Pharma uh, Cynical Security Institute, and I'll let Ramesh just uh, give a quick overview of that. Now, we are not a competing organization. I just want to, everyone to know, right? Uh, Ramesh is focusing on some many key areas of, of the pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry. Uh, you know, Tapper is more of a holistic approach to the whole of supply chain. And of course, obviously, you know, there's a, uh, it's important right, that we work together because there's a lot of sharing of information and data and ideas that we can do and work together uh, to impact the industry. So if we can go to the next slide, I, I just want to fire some questions to, uh, to Ramesh today, uh, really uh, sort of um, uh, looking at some of the issues. So but Ramesh, look, here's some of the talking points, but um, what, what is the impact of COVID-19 and I suppose post COVID-19 on the pharmaceutical industry? And look, in terms of, you know, what are the knock-on effects uh, of the supply chains, uh, some of the collaboration uh, issues, partnerships, and, uh, you know, anything that you're doing with uh, government and private industry? Okay. Hi, everyone, all listeners, and thank you, Tony, for inviting me once again for this webinar to discuss the uh, many real challenges and, um, you know, the very good set of questions as well, um, you know, on the issues that we face and uh, what are the issues that we could um, possibly look at into coming to terms with as the new norm. Um, you know, talking about the new norm, I am still coming to terms with, you know, being on Zoom and webinars and podcasts and uh, hopefully I, you know, I hope to attain the uh, influencer stage uh, by the time this um, COVID is yesterday's news. So, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, other than that, Tony, uh, you know, I, I've never seen actually TAPA and, and PSI as, uh, you know, on the, uh, as competitors or on the uh, opposite end of the uh, spectrum. But instead, I think both um, associations actually complement one another, um, you know, yes. in terms of advancing together, in terms of providing um, an education, a capacity building, you know, stuff like that, that instead of one organization coming, both of us coming together and reaching out to a far wider audience. I think that was the objective all along since we started uh, communicating. Correct. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. OK, so what? Well, so let me just jump into the set of questions, um, you know, as economies around the world, everybody knows this now. You know, everyone is suffering from the impact of COVID-19, be it businesses who are experiencing losses, um, you know, people losing their jobs, employment rates going up, uh, many face um, challenges, um, you know, that's never been seen or heard till now. Um, and at this point in time, the uh, pharmaceutical industry is actually taking center stage, rightfully so, um, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But again, it very much actually depends on the capacity of each and every pharmaceutical company uh, where they are at this stage in the pandemic. Uh, how they are fighting it and how they are combating it. Why I say this is because um, some of the pharmaceutical companies have donated essential medicines to governments and are working with relevant authorities. And, and the others are actually, <clears throat> you know, they are playing very quiet contributors, working behind, coming out with vaccines, doing a lot of backdoor research as well, um, and hopefully coming out with a, a vaccine at the earliest opportunity. So that's one of the reasons. And of course, this is done on an almost daily basis, which it's not made known to the public for very obvious reasons. Um, you know, but with respect to the supply chain itself, the COVID lockdown you know, um, has resulted countries um, all over the world um, to see a reduction in the uh, supply of essential active pharmaceutical ingredients, the APIs, which in turn results in an equally reduction of supply of much needed medicines. Um, also, there is a scarcity in manpower because, you know, there are team A, team Bs now that's being deployed in the resources. People are working from home more than not. And where it's possible, they are all online like us trying to carry out their work. 
And in Singapore itself, it's almost like 80% of the uh, workforce is currently working from home. So this has resulted in a significant slowdown from the time where medicine is being manufactured till the time where consumers actually get their hands on the medication. Again, I'm not talking about counterfeit medications that are readily available. I'm talking about genuine medication for consumers, which much needed for patients. <clears throat> Despite the lockdown, COVID-19 still has not deterred criminals from profiteering. Take for example, I mean, previously I've mentioned in my podcast, the findings from Interpol-led operations, the findings from Europol-led operations, but just last weekend, right, there was a theft involving 500,000, half a million masks valued at a little more than 400,000 euros that was stolen. So, so again, so, you know, criminals, other than on top of counterfeiting, they are heavily involved in theft, illegal diversion. Um, this, I think, would, you know, not only apply for pharmaceutical, but I think it across the board as well. Everybody is, is suffering in silence. So the yeah. lockdown... So, Ramesh, you, you know, yes. Ramesh, just, if I could just interject very quickly, you know, we had um, uh, a webinar with um, BSI and TT Club, uh, and both organizations uh, reported an increase in, you know, the theft uh, of uh, the uh, personal protection equipment and also the, the mask. So good point there. Right. Yeah. So unless it's publicized, unless people report, it, it's, you know, it goes unnoticed. So at this Correct, point in time, yeah. I, I'm, I'm stepping away from the questions that were asked. I want to go back to Silva's, uh, you know, topic on, on the, the need and the real urgency for members to come on board and to update the, the cases that they have faced because only then the library of information that you know that papa has or psi has you know will be built upon and when it's built upon it's only then that members and everybody else can benefit from it if you don't share we never know if we, nobody knows it goes totally unnoticed and of course, who tends to, who the only one tends to, uh, to to profit from it or to benefit from it would be the criminals, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so coming back to this uh, lockdown situation and stuff, I'm not sure how many uh, of us are really aware, but the actual supply and the movement of cargo has actually gone down by 85%. This is really, really significant. But I'm not only talking about the slowdown in the cargo, I'm now coming to what does it actually mean for the post-COVID? This is where the problem comes in. Very mm. briefly, all the parcels that are currently in storage or in fulfillment centers, once the lockdown you know, eases all over the region, they will start flooding the customs. Customs will see an unprecedented volume of parcels coming in from all over mm -hmm. the world. Criminals will apply um, you know, take this opportunity to apply their trade and take advantage and start swamping all the counterfeit products. And this could be ranging from counterfeit test kits, COVID vaccines that would be already available by then, and medicines to treat COVID. So this is exactly like what I'm trying to say. We'll start flooding everybody and there will be a chain reaction from the time where counterfeiters flood the immigration from the customs and then the, um, uh, you know, un- um, unwavering uh, patients who want ready medicines and they get uh, affected by it and then in the end the healthcare again suffers for it so yeah. that would Ramesh, be a know, significant change yeah sorry yeah it was uh, interesting you said that right because um, um, Tapa was asked for a uh, you know to comment basically on on trade compliance okay and um, and obviously counterfeit comes uh, along with that but in terms of the trade compliance you're right um, you know there will be people who will use this op this opportunity to to sort of leverage off of it and uh yeah obviously with the ppe and the counterfeit and uh trade right. compliance you know it, it's potentially uh, big issues and i agree with you there could be a, a, an enormous knock-on effect exactly and already as it is even you know uh pre-covid every year i mean I, I keep talking about this as always every year there are an estimated about estimated 300,000 children dying after consuming fake medication. I do not want to think what is the numbers are going to be like post-COVID. 
Mm. Um, right. So this is a very sad uh, details. All right. So the next is the uh, post COVID will also see industries embracing digitization in managing and safeguarding their supply chain. This is also a very prudent approach that um, supply chain industries will look at. Uh, business, businesses would want to ensure that they have a better end-to-end -end oversight to safeguard their products from being counterfeited. We've already discussed about this in depth in the last podcast. Uh, but of course, uh, this will make the already complicated supply chain even more complicated. When anything gets more complicated, there's always a tendency for counterfeiters to come in, be it mm -hmm. you know, the uh, over-publicized blockchain capacity, uh, how unpenetrable it, uh, it can be, you know, there can always be a way to such things. Uh, of yeah. course, next, yeah, next we will see an increase. This is again post-COVID. Um, you know, we will see an increase in e-commerce activity, uh, and this will continue to see and search without a doubt the sale of um, counterfeit medicines as well as other merchandises. Of course, will continue to be on the increase. Um, and to avoid detection, um, you know, the purchasers or the, the syndicates, what they can do is that they can start posting everything in small parcels. You know, there's this big parcels and then small parcels that goes into fulfillment centers, they are broke, and then they flood all over the world, at least for, for medicines as well. And therein lies the problem. If you are just talking about the Asia Pacific region, it's very wide. And it consists of both uh, developing countries and developed countries. And of course, that's it. We cannot uh, expect the, the enforcement efforts, the energy, the resources, the allocation, everything to be consistent across the board. Uh, this is where law enforcement agencies and governments actually can reach out, take this opportunity to reach out and foster a partnership with private sectors, private industries as well. Uh, but mm. you know, COVID-19 will go on to challenge the already time-tested relationship between the governments and private sectors. I think Tony, you and I both agree on this. Yeah, uh, correct. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. So outfits like you know PSI and Tapa have always emphasized. I think we will go on to still, you know, uh, echoing this as well. The need and the urgencies to build a partnership with the various um, agencies. Uh, but you see, the, the thing is that while PSI um, has has some success in developing countries, the real challenge is actually with the more developed, more advanced countries. Uh, engaging with the law enforcement has always been consistently tough. Uh, but you know, all said and done, we will PSI and I think Tapa as well will will continue our efforts working with the various uh, members that we have, and of course with the uh, relevant uh, law enforcement agencies to safeguard public health. Um, I think I've answered um, most of the questions. Uh, other than mm. going into the details of uh, how syndicates uh, operate, I think that one, we do not want to promote any potential syndicates who are actually listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, yeah. that, 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 that part of the story, I think we will leave it to the uh, <clears throat> law enforcement. <laughs> <clears throat> no, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, look, thank you very much for that. And uh, I just want to, touch on and and look don't forget you know ask some of those questions in the um, in the questions uh, box please if you have any um look, i just want to you know uh, sort of talk about that importance you know me and you've had a lot of discussions on this and uh, um look it's you know it can't be a one way street right if um if the members um, in, you know your members uh, for for the, for the psi and our members for tapa look if you know, if we really want to address these issues, right, we have to have that data. And of course, you know, this is the, the role of this team here to 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 uh, retrieve that data uh, and then to to use it in the, in the best um, uh, manner. And what right. we do are, um, you know, during the, the Q&A, uh, what we do, we just bring up um, some of that data uh, and uh, show you the best practice. So. When you see the data and how it's rolled up, you'll see that it's in a sort of an informatic graphic um, point of view. But um, as Ramesh says, but when we share that with law enforcement, um, um, you know, that's it's key, right? It, they, they can understand some of the issues uh, and understand where some of the priorities lie. So look, if we look at uh, and what we'll be doing on, on these calls going forward, right? And we, and we will alter the time of these calls. 
uh, to to make sure that we can bring some experts in from from Europe, uh, uh, so you can hear um, you know some of the the you know the the, the way the Tapramir has been used in this data. But you can see from the infographic um, put up on the screen here, um, when you when you start presenting this data to government officials, uh, they start realizing uh, that you know organized crime um, is making a living out of uh, cargo crime. Uh, and look, and don't forget that these are just ones that are reported to TAPA uh, and um, reported to the police. Um, as as uh, as Malik has said to us uh, a number of times, the, the a lot of the issues, right? And don't forget, Malik only represents one insurance company, but a lot of the issues are is that a lot of the losses uh, are under the deductible level, uh, or they can't. The, the location of the loss cannot be determined, so the police won't accept the crime report. Uh, and of course, then where, where where does that data end up? It ends up inside the the company is just lost data, and nothing ever happens with it. And what Tabs is saying is, look, put that into our database. Uh, the information is dealt with uh, completely confidentially. So you can um, have a look at uh, the uh, the platform. So Sam, I don't know if you can just pull that up in a minute, just to show everyone. Uh, Silver showed an example, but we can quickly just flick over to um, the Tapper Global website and you can just see where you put that data. Now, when you see that data, you, you realize that this is not about whether it's company A, company B, company C. This is about us all working as a team to basically share that data. And what I want to try and do in a moment, um, and uh, I want the panel to be ready for this, please, is that when we looked at that poll result, uh, there were some good figures there. So look, Ramesh, um, some, uh, you know, very insightful uh, um, sort of information there for the for the listeners uh, or the watchers rather. So um, what I want to uh, do is is just uh, can we bring that result of the poll back up, please, uh, Samantha? Tony, sorry, Tony. Sorry. Can I hmm. just go back to the, uh, the the slides, the the last one? I think that was a very impressive slide. Just wanted to add just a little bit on that. Hmm. All right. So. Okay, uh, you know the earlier slide, you know, is a very beautiful infographic on on all the uh, different data as well. Uh, right. But, you know, for for the listeners as well as our PSI members or, or TAPA members, regardless, you know, such an information, um, I think uh, one needs to look at it on a very broad spectrum of it. Um, if you are going to launch a, a product in another country, if you're going to do business in another country, this kind of information is very, very vital. When you look at uh, the, the, the trending in terms of uh, theft, in terms of uh, illegal diversion, in terms of counterfeiting, you can effectively allocate your resources in that region uh, instead of uh, wasting um, you know, lots of money and time and effort. This could be stepping stones as to how you want to channel your energy. Um, so yes, yeah, so that, that's something and I really want to say, don't just take the numbers as for face value. I think everybody who's looking at these numbers need to spin around the idea as to how these numbers can be used and how contributing to these numbers can effectively help them at, in the, at the later stage as well. Yeah, that, that's, that's the two cents I wanted to just add on. No, it's a good point. Um, Selva, do you want to add any, anything to that? Yes, correct. Um, I think it's going to be sounding like I'm repeating it, but the thing is what we need today is actually the data. We need to know what is happening um, so that we actually have all this information to come up with good practices for the industry. And as Ramesh mentioned about pharmaceutical, uh, I am also coming from a pharmaceutical industry and whatever he said is actually is, is the truth. And in fact, there's more episodes that we are looking forward to happen in the future, which we do not know yet. But the thing is, there are other industries out there which have got small quantities of products, but large values. So pharmaceutical industry comes under that category. Our volumes mm. are small, but our value is large. But there are other industries where the volumes are large. And these volumes right, sometimes, yeah. and the products are sometimes so small, so minute, 
that you might not even have the opportunity to understand if one box is missing out of a whole palette. But the thing is, if there is a way of finding that or reporting that, it gives us the information to understand how we can prevent this to make to make that incident become a pallet loss for the future. So yeah, the whole no, purpose I, of I, yeah yeah absolutely so but yeah and uh, look Malik as we as we said you know um, uh, it's it's a problem isn't it? It's a problem in the supply chain um, where um, you know the police don't get the report, Tampa doesn't get the report. You don't even see the 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 issue because of the you know the, the fact that it doesn't meet the you know deductible so you know what what is uh, you know what would you be saying to uh, to tapper members and anyone really because you don't have to be a tapper member to to report the data but what would you be saying to the tapper members well again like everybody's saying data is important you need to look at data you need to look at history uh, incidents however small you can use this data and and with the uh, effort of TAPA to collect and uh, consolidate, then this data become very uh, strong, strong information for all the members. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and and uh, and that <clears throat> that really reinforces uh, Ramesh's point. So so thanks, Malik. Um, so Sam, if we can just bring up the the poll result, the results um, of the of the risk assessment and. Uh, Look, I, I think just that these are very interesting. Okay, so um, look for the for the twenty percent that don't review. Okay, uh, you know maybe uh, maybe what we could do is look at you know ha have you got the tools to do that? Have you had the training to do that? Okay, and that's what um, you know Tapper is trying to do is to help uh, um, develop though that training going forward uh, for a risk management process. Uh, but uh, let me just ask. Um, um, uh, Prashant and uh, Kevin in terms of the how often do you do a, a risk assessment so look in terms of the results you know you have one that's saying once uh, a quarter uh, once every year uh, once every six months so what I, ideally um, you know what would what sort of advice would you be giving to to listeners of, of how that should be addressed let's go to uh, Prashant first in an ideal scenario, uh, you take. Sorry. It's, it's important. Hmm. So I think Sorry, it's Prashant, important. Sorry, Prashant, we just couldn't hear you a bit more clearly, please. Yeah, Prashant, I think there might be some connectivity issues. Uh, can you? Uh, uh, let's come back to Prashant in one second. Uh, Kevin, can you uh, can you go ahead? Okay, so based on our experience, so we will review it at least uh, two times a year. So mm -hmm. every 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 time we review the contract with the ARSP, we have to do the risk assessment. So before we given the contractor to, I mean, awarded the contractor to the new ARSP. So and then uh, in the middle of the year, so we will have uh, another risk assessment. So IFQ in the IFQ and also uh, in the asset, uh, the evaluate the service for, for, for this LSP. So only in case if we have a serious the theft issues. So at that moment, so we will immediately take the actions to review that road for the asset risk level. So, and the, Meanwhile, if that countries or that regions, we have any other cases not related to our companies, but we will still review it. That will be happen only in that countries we have a very serious issue. So maybe it's the economic or the political or the riotous. So based on that kind of information, we will do the assessment to secure the cargoes in that country. So this is our experience. Yeah, and Kevin, you know, that's a good point because someone's just asked me a um, a private question saying um, it's, it's really picking up what Ramesh said and what you've actually answered. OK, so, what, you know, what happens if there's a change? What happens? Um, you know, what do you do with the, uh, you know, how do you do that in your risk assessment? And I think you both answered it. Yeah, one, um, you know, if we have that data, 
it allows us to do the, the risk assessments. And as you quite rightly said, Kevin, if there's a change in the circumstances uh, of the business, uh, uh, then you know the, the risk assessment should also be done. So, um, Samantha, we have uh, another question coming in. No, that's all we have. Okay, so we have a, uh, what advice is uh, being passed to its member during this time with the backlog of products being shipped, presumably the shipment level, let me just, uh, presumably the, the ship, sorry, presumably the reduced shipping levels means a far greater capacity of product being warehoused. Okay, so look, if I can, Nick, if I could just take a, a, a start to answer that for you. So thanks for very much for answering, asking the question because it is a very good question, right? So at the moment, um, as you know, there is a, a lot of backlog uh, inside um, ports. Um, and uh, look, as, as Ramesh said, uh, the so some of the fear is that once, um, but once the whole supply chain op opens up, there are gonna be a lot of, uh, not only um, it, there are gonna be a lot of uh, counterfeit issues, the trade compliance uh, problems, but also the insurance companies are predicting, certainly TT Club uh, mentioned on the last webinar, that they expected uh, uh, a lot of crime issues to come up, right? Whether there being been pilferages uh, uh, either in the warehouse uh, or, or, or BSI had reported an increased theft from warehouses, okay? So, so obviously that's going to be uh, one problem. Now, in terms of the uh, capacity of the warehouses, there have been some reports uh, sent across to us where where the capacity of the warehouses are, are basically they're bursting at the seams. And of course, it means that product has been stored in trailers and in containers. And of course, then look, the same fears are, are uh, coming from that. You know, have they been stored in a secure environment? Uh, you know, what is the process to check that every day? Uh, and you know there is a there is a risk that you know the, there's going to be some uh, events there. Now look, every time there's an event there, um, it, it, it does uh, create customs problems. It means that you know uh, the paperwork has to be redone as well as the the the, 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 va the valuation has to be uh, uh, resubmitted. So anybody else want to uh, take up any uh, re respond to some of those that, that question at all, please? Oh, Tony, I think I think yeah. you got I think you got the message uh, quite mm. clear. Yeah, yeah. I think you've summed it but, up well. Yeah, Nick, it is a it's a good question, right? It's yeah. it, I know it's creating a lot of problems within the uh, in this in the supply chain. So look, let's um um, uh, Prashant, are you back with us? I know the internet seemed to have dropped when you were talking. Can you just try again, and we and uh, we we'll just get your response on that risk assessment? Sure, I will. Yeah, are you able to hear me now? Yeah, that's a bit better, yeah. All right, wonderful. I think uh, basically Kevin answered most of the points that I wanted to say. But just to add to what he mentioned, uh, I think in an ideal scenario, uh, quarterly risk reviews are the, are the most uh, best suited ones. But then that's also a function of how volumes and the scale that your operations uh, work. In the scenario that we work in, we typically do review uh, twice a year. And that's in line with what Kevin said, because it's also uh, fact that you have built your own knowledge as to how these routes work. Uh, but what is critical, I think it's also when you introduce new routes to also do a physical assessment of how things work in the route that you have played, uh, planned, especially more so if it's a if it's a land route. Uh, because uh, while I know cargo theft through seas, through customs, there are chances of uh, you know things happening. But I think uh, if you have analyzed what uh, database that TAPA has in the IIS database, you'll see that the land routes are much more vulnerable than anywhere else. Uh, and that means whenever you introduce a new route, your risk assessment has to be that much more holistic, much more detailed, uh, and literally had to be planned to the detail. Um, and I think one of the key elements is also to uh, ensure that uh, we have the uh, PSR standards in place. I know in Europe, it's, it's uh, picking up very well. But I think in the rest of the world, that also needs to be uh, planned and adopted to, which will then help us in uh, assessing these routes going forward and also the risk assessment that comes with it. Yeah, Prashant, good point. And look, just for the listeners, that the PSR, PSR is the parking security requirements. And uh, look, that's been rolled out through Europe. And as uh, Prashant said, it's been very successful because, uh, you know, 
trucking, ground transportation. Uh, you know, Kevin will tell you it's massive in China. It's obviously uh, massive in India. Uh, and look, you know, once a truck's out on the road, it's obviously uh, always at risk. So we, we will uh, provide some more of that data. But what Prashant said is is totally correct. Um, I think this is the benefit of the IIS data is that you can use that data to do the, the risk assessments as uh, Silver alluded to at the beginning uh, and Prashant has, has reinforced. And look, and Ramesh said it as well, uh, you know, we have the luxury of having that, that data and we can only achieve that if we, uh, unless we work together. So um, I think we have another question coming in, Samantha. Yes, we have a question from the ground. Would you like to share with us how the Law Enforcement Alliance are supporting IIS and TAPA? And as a member of TAPA, if we are able to also get their support as well? Yes, certainly. Who, Silva, do you want to take that, uh, that question? I know Ramesh, you know, but you could explain what you do for your members. Uh, Silva, go ahead. Yeah, so I think for our IIS portion, I think that's a good question, first of all. Um, this is what I said at the start of our presentation, that we are building our resources and our engagement with the law enforcement agencies. And of course, once those things are more formal and in place, you will actually see how companies can actually benefit from it. So right now, today, the question, the, the biggest question is, are we ready to inform the law enforcement agencies what are the problems our members in TAPA are facing? And for that, are we having data in it? So this is where IIS has to step up and we have to step up our platform as well, together with you as the members on how we can leverage from the enforcement agencies. Yeah, and I think this is also quite similar to what um, Ramesh will also advise us in terms of how they are working together with the law enforcement agencies in, in the other places as well. Okay, uh, right. So I, I think PSI's approach may be just a, a little different here. Um, in terms of uh, collating of um, evidence, all right, um, sometimes it, it, it takes different modes here. Uh, there are instances where members uh, provide us an incident update of uh, either a theft, illegal diversion, or a counterfeit case, but we don't immediately act on it. What it goes into a data and similar to IIS, and then we store it for filing. Any action that PSI wants to take is very much dependent on the intention of the member. If the member says, all right, I have an issue in, in this particular region, and uh, I already have this many cases which we already know, then what we do is that we reach out based on our already existing uh, partnership or uh, collaboration effort with the law enforcement agency, and then we will package everything and then we will give it to them for them to carry out the next course of action. But of course, at that point in time, PSI's role would be to be a face, an introductory media between the member and the law enforcement agencies. And then we bring them together. <clears throat> this is one aspect of how we go about doing it. The other aspect would be like during this COVID uh, season pandemic, right? What we do is that we engage the services of vendors uh, in, in different regions, and then we carry out a global effort. And to this, we have identified maybe about 5,000 websites that are actually selling um, unapproved counterfeit uh, medications that mm. are being sold. So what we do now is that we take that finding and then we will give it to the respective law enforcement agencies. We have given it to WCO, we have given it to Europol, Interpol, uh, other local law enforcement agencies, health regulators as well. And then for them to go and review the data that we have given. So what they will do after that is that they will review this data and then if there's anything that they want to bite, they can come and come back to work with us. But of course, when you trigger an investigation, everything becomes another mode of confidential. And that we, we don't tap into that. We will allow enforcement agencies to carry out their efforts as to how they're supposed to go about doing it. And as and when they need any other agent, uh, assistance, we are always there to assist them. This, this is how we go about doing it. Yeah, Ramesh, look, it's not too dissimilar to us. And uh, look, it goes into yeah, the next question. Well, uh, yeah, from uh, from Lauren here. So you know, do we see clusters of incidents in certain areas? 
where we can do specific projects uh, and or engagements with uh, LEAs? So the answer is yes. Uh, so as Rami said, look, he, he has a very similar approach um, uh, on a number of case uh, occasions. Right? Um, Tampa has been aware of um, certain information. Uh, and look, uh, as Ramesh said, look, we've acted as the interface um, between the, the member and law enforcement. Um, you know, sometimes when you go uh, to law enforcement as a individual, as an individual company, and this even happened in the UK, uh, the, uh, the organization in question didn't get the, the full response they required. Uh, look, they eventually, um, uh, they and another came to TAPA, and then would you believe it, by the time we, we did our research, we had something like 30, 40, 40 companies involved, uh, and look, TAPA represented those companies, and we actually um, uh, went to the Department of Trade and Industry uh, and um, got their buy-in to address the issue. And of course, look, you know, once the DTI was involved, then the then it was um, a green light really for the for the police to actually get involved. So it's a good question, Lauren. And look, Lauren, I think what we should do. Um, Samantha, if you can just make a note of this, uh, on Lauren's uh, question, we should uh, show that case study um, on, on the next uh, webinar. All right, so look, guys, we're coming up to um, uh, the uh, hour now. Uh, yeah. yeah, and um, wow. look, uh, I, look, the panelists I'm are looking you're worn out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the panelists are, uh, are looking worn out and tired now. So, <laughs> so, uh, so let's... Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's let them get back to their uh, day job, uh, etc. But look, thank you very much for attending. Let me pass you back to uh, Crystal for the for the closing. Thank you. Stay safe, stay apart, stay sane. Yeah. Thank you, Tony, and thank you all of our speakers. Thank you for joining the webinar on data intelligence preventing cargo crime. We hope that you enjoyed the webinar and the question and answer session. If you have any questions and feedback, please feel free to contact Tapa or Ramesh from PSI. We look forward to seeing you at the next webinar sessions. Goodbye.